As Anna Arnold Hatchman listens to King delivering his famous I Have a Dream speech on the 28th August 1963, she scribbles a note on a piece of paper. We have a dream. He should have said that, because he was also speaking on behalf of dozens, even hundreds of people who were involved in organizing the march on Washington. The majority of them women, just like the participants in the peaceful march itself. They were not included in this dream. They were not even represented on the podium that day, although that's not entirely true. They were allowed to open their mouth for entertainment as a singing interlude, like the great Mahalia Jackson, for example. As so often in history, the achievements of women are ignored, concealed and minimized. Yet the American civil rights movement, actually not a single resistance movement in history, would have had a chance to even exist without the contributions of women. That's why today I'm going to do what's long overdue, introduce the women of change, the heart and spines of the abolitionist, civil rights and black power movement. I would like to start with the early resistance fighters, the early catalysts of change. Right at the beginning, a woman to whom a Quentin Tarantino film should actually be dedicated, Aunt Polly Jackson, the silent warrior of the Underground Railroad. In the narrative of America's fight for freedom, few stories resonate like that of Aunt Polly Jackson. She was an escaped slave turned savior in the clandestine network of the Underground Railroad. In Ohio's unique settlement of Africa, which was a refuge for those fleeing the horrors of enslavement. Jackson stood as a symbol of defiance and protection. By night, she disguised herself as an elderly woman and armed herself with nothing more than a butcher knife and a kettle of boiling water. Like this, she fought against slave catches, like she'd be a grumpy looking Batman. Her humble home became a critical stop on the journey to liberty, offering shelter and hope to countless souls. Jackson's legacy tells a story of courage beyond self-preservation. It's a tale of a woman who, with each daring act and life she helped save, quietly dismantled the chains of slavery. Though her name may not be widely known, her actions remain a testament to the relentless spirit of those who fought for freedom in the darkest of times. Good start, I hope. Let's get to someone who's a better known hero. Harriet Tubman, the Moses of her people. Harriet Tubman was born into the cruel reality of slavery, but emerged as a formidable figure in the abolitionist movement and a key architect of the Underground Railroad. Tubman's early life was marked by severe hardships. Despite suffering frequent beatings and enduring heavy labor, even while ill with measles or after a violent head injury from which she suffered her whole life, she displayed unwavering the Determination. Renowned for her extraordinary courage, she not only secured her own freedom, but also risked her life repeatedly to secure others. She returned to Maryland from where she escaped 13 times, leading her family and numerous other slaves to safety in the north of the US and Canada. An endeavor she pursued tirelessly from around 1849 until the end of the Civil War. During the Civil War, she served as both a spy and a nurse, contributing significantly to the Union's efforts. With each daring mission, Tubman, often referred to as Moses, reinforced the testament, which was that the human will must triumph over subjugation. Now we come to one of my new heroes, Sojourne Truth. Once a slave became a towering figure in the fight for abolition and women's rights. Her renowned Ain't I Woman speech at the 1851 Ohio Women's Rights Convention boldly challenged both racial and gender oppression. Yet Truth's activism extended far beyond her speeches, as she tirelessly campaigned for change throughout her life. Enduring violence and hardship, Truth's journey to activism began when she still was a slave, and she courageously sued for her son's return after he was sold, making her the first black woman to win against a white man in a US court. Her advocacy went on to address broader issues of racial injustice, including speaking with President Abraham Lincoln and confronting racial segregation. Visionary, Truth understood the significant yet unrecognized contributions of the black community to America's wealth, which was not some Something the wealthy white ones did like hearing. She advocated for reparations for black Americans long before it was widely discussed. But that's not enough. She was a rare voice linking racism and sexism, foreseeing the risks of ignoring black women's rights in the fight for equality. Truth uniquely combined her Christian faith with her feminist beliefs, asserting that they were complementary, not conflicting. So if you need an idol, why not good old Sojourner Truth? Let's jump to the islands. 
because also here we can find inspiring figures of resistance. For example, Queen Nanny of the Maroons, an Ashanti warrior brought to Jamaica and thrust into slavery, became a key leader in the resistance against British colonial rule. After escaping, she established Nanny Town in the Blue Mountains, a strategic base from where she led the Maroons, a group of escaped slaves. In guerrilla warfare, it tells a lot that this place was named after her. Nanny's militarily tactics were innovative and effective, involving ambushes and the use of natural camouflage. She also utilized the Abang horn for communication, which played a crucial role in orchestrating attacks and disrupting British supply lines. Her leadership was instrumental in liberating over a thousand slaves and culminated in the First Maroon War. Her ability to maintain autonomy against British forces led to a historic peace treaty that recognized the Maroon's freedom and self-governance. Declared a national hero of Jamaica, Nanny's influence extends far beyond her military achievements. She symbolizes resilience and a relentless fight for freedom. As it is so nice in the Caribbean, we jump over to Guadeloupe, where we find the story of La Moulatresse Solitude. Born to an enslaved American mother and a French sailor, she became a symbol of resistance in Guadeloupe. In 1802, as Napoleon sought to reinstate slavery, Solitude fearlessly joined the rebellion. Her pregnancy didn't deter her. She fought valiantly until her capture. Tragically, she was executed right after giving birth. Today, Solitude's spirit of resistance is celebrated, her story echoing through time as a powerful reminder of the fight for freedom. And before it gets too comfy on the island, we jump space and time to the beginning of civil rights. And you will see that it was the women who turned the movement into a mass movement, as Coretta Scott King said. Starting with Claudia Jones, the significant figure in the Communist Party, was a determined advocate for black feminism. Her vision was to establish an anti-imperialist coalition led by the working class and significantly driven by women's involvement. Jones firmly believed in the power of black women's militancy to catalyze broader movements for social change. She once wrote, The bourgeoisie is fearful of the militancy of the Negro woman. And for good reason. The capitalists know, far better than many progressives seem to know, that once Negro women begin to take action, the militancy of the whole Negro people, and thus of the anti-imperialist coalition, is greatly enhanced. Historically, the Negro woman has been the guardian, the protector, of the Negro family. As mother, as Negro, and as worker, the Negro woman fights against the wiping out of the Negro family, against the Jim Crow ghetto existence which destroys the health, morale, and very life of millions of her sisters, brothers, and children. Viewed in this light, it is not accidental that the American bourgeoisie has intensified its oppression, not only of the Negro people in general, but of Negro women in particular. Nothing so exposes the drive to fascization in the nation as the callous attitude which the bourgeoisie displays and cultivates toward Negro women. Her activism, however, led to her imprisonment in 1948 and subsequent deportation to the United Kingdom. Undeterred, Jones continued her advocacy work in the UK, where she founded the West Indian Gazette. Through this publication, she aimed to provide a voice for marginalized communities and continue her lifelong commitment to activism and social justice. Over 20 years later, the black female voice is still trying to be heard, and our next heroine is showing with her engagement that you can't ignore the fact that a voice was rising. Septima Ponce Clark, hailed as the mother of the movement by Martin Luther King Jr., played a transformative role in the civil rights movement through her focus on education. Born to a father who had been a slave, Clark's journey into activism was fueled by the stark disparities she observed between the schools for black and white children and the systematic injustices in her own teaching career. In a segregated South, where educational opportunities for African Americans were severely limited, Clark pioneered a path of enlightenment. She innovated ways to teach adults literacy in the evening after teaching children during the day. Recognizing that literacy and a deep understanding of citizenship rights were key to combating racial oppression, she founded citizenship schools. Starting on the South Carolina Sea Island, these schools became more than just places of learning. They were liberation hubs, turning disenfranchised individuals into informed, empowered citizens. She reached hundreds of thousands with that people that became the knowledge acquired members of the civil rights movement. Clark's approach was pragmatic and revolutionary. She focused on practical skills such as reading, writing and filling out forms, catering especially to marginalized groups. One of the notable students was Rosa Parks, who attended her classes a few months before the landmark Montgomery bus boycott. Despite her significant contribution, Clark's efforts, like those of many women in the movement, were often overshadowed by sexism. She remembered that Reverend Abernathy couldn't understand why a woman would be included on the executive board of the SCLC. Addressing this issue, she pointed out that one of the greatest weaknesses of the civil rights movement was the unequal treatment of women. A sentiment echoed in her poignant remark, this country was built up from women keeping their mouths shut. 
I guess our next heroine felt the same way. Ella Baker was another significant figure in the civil rights movement, who was relegated to the sidelines by the sausage party called the Big Six. Even though without her, shit wouldn't have get done, Baker was dedicated to grassroots activism and the empowerment of ordinary people. Her work with major organizations like the NACP, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was crucial in guiding their strategies and direction. Baker's philosophy was rooted in the belief that the power of change lies within the people themselves, not in charismatic leaders and personal cult. She often said, give light and people will find the way, underscoring her commitment to participatory democracy and community-driven change. Her approach to activism was unique. She worked mostly behind the scenes, orchestrating strategies and building a foundation that fueled the civil rights activism of the 1960s. She was simply a doer, and what does a doer do? She does. You didn't see me on television. You didn't see news stories about me, Baker once remarked, highlighting her preference for a more subtle but impactful role. She focused on strengthening communities from within, believing that strong people don't need strong leaders. This philosophy was central to her effort as she sought to create a sustainable momentum for civil rights, empowering generation after generation to stand up for their rights and forge their own path toward equality. Our next heroine is probably the first woman that comes to mind when talking talking about women in the civil rights movement. Rosa Parks' act of defiance on a Montgomery bus in 1955, when she refused to vacate her seat for a white passenger, sparked a monumental shift in the civil rights movement. This quiet act of resistance led to the historic Montgomery bus boycott, a 381-day mass protest against racial segregation on public transportation. The boycott's success culminated in a Supreme Court decision declaring segregated buses unconstitutional. On that fateful December evening, Parks, motivated by the recent lynching of 14-year-old Emmett Till in Mississippi chose to challenge the entrenched system of racial oppression. Her arrest not only triggered the boycott, but also galvanized the nation's tension on the injustices of racial segregation. The retelling, though, says that she was too exhausted to stand up at the end of a long day's work as a seamstress for a white man, as the bus driver told her to do. Wrong. She repeated again and again throughout her life. She was tired of the humiliation. She was tired of being denied the rights she was entitled to. Rosa Parks had long been an activist by this time and had been campaigning for decades for a black life and dignity, including a leading role at the National Association for the Advancement for Colored People. Despite becoming an icon of resistance, Parks paid a personal price for her bravery. She lost her job and faced years of death threat. Yet her resolve remained unshaken. Her courage and determination earned her the title First Lady of Civil Rights and Mother of the Freedom Movement. Rosa Parks once reflected, I have learned over the years that when one's mind is made up, this diminishes fear. No Knowing what must be done does away with fear. Rosa was a fearless and courageous warrior, even though she's often reduced to this small, modest and shy seamstress. And Rosa was furious about the exclusion of the women on the stage of the March on Washington. Like Rosa, our next heroine only received a verbal pat on the back as a thank you. Daisy Bates was born in Arkansas, where she faced a harrowing loss early in life when her mother, Millie Riley, was raped and murdered by three white men, a crime that was ignored by the authorities. This injustice planted seeds of a longing for revenge and deep hate towards white people within Bates. Guided by her adoptive father's wise words to channel this hate into fighting discrimination and justice, she transformed her personal grief into a powerful force for social change. As the president of the Arkansas NAACP, Bates stepped into the forefront of the civil rights movement during the Little Rock integration crisis of 1957. She became a guidance force for the Little Rock Nine, a group of African-American students who wanted to enroll at the all-white Central High School. By that, challenging the entrenched segregation in American education, Bates Home served not just as a sanctuary for these students, but also as a strategic center for planning and support, bolstering their courage and resilience in the face of intense opposition. Bates' unyielding support and advocacy during this tumultuous period were pivotal. Her leadership not only fortified the Little Rock Nine, but also galvanized the community and the nation around the cause of desegregation. Our next fighter was also on site at the march. Dorothy Hyde, the ignored member of the Big Six. During a time when racial separation was the norm and resistance to the integration of African Americans was intense, Dorothy Hyde, a dedicated civil rights activist, stood at the forefront of the fight against segregation and lynching. Hyde was actually among the first civil rights leaders to advocate against these deep-rooted injustices. Her approach was unique in the way that she recognized the intersection of gender and racial inequality, understanding that these issues needed to be addressed collectively. According to the motto, when talking about inequality, don't forget inequality causes
caused by sexism. This perception was ahead of its time and set the stage for broader discussions about intersectionality in the civil rights and feminist movements. President Obama, acknowledging her significant contributions, referred to Hyde as the godmother of the civil rights movement and a hero. Her vision and determination to combat both racial and gender inequality have left an indelible mark on the fight for civil rights. Dorothy Hyde, who had been sitting near King on the podium, invited after the March black and white women to a meeting the next day at the headquarters of the National Council of Negro Women, which she chaired. The title of the event after the march, what? While the men were invited to the White House. In addition to racism, sexism was now also up for debate and how things should continue for women. After this event, it was clear that the activists never wanted to be excluded and demeaned as second-class human beings again. For them, the march in Washington became a turning point for the women's movement within their own ranks. It happens, of course, that women and their contributions to the resistance struggle are honored, which is more often the case in the last years. However, it is mostly not as pioneers or fighters but as mothers, godmothers, grandmothers or as first ladies of the movement as I did in some places here, pardon me for that. This ignores the fact that they were just like the men also on the front fighting at sit-ins and demonstrations as they usually organized them. They were attacked, spat on and beaten up just like the men. They were attacked with tear gas, chased by police dogs and had their houses bombed. They were arrested and imprisoned, terrorized and traumatized. They risked their jobs and their lives while caring for their children and husbands on the side. And still, they were often ignored or it was their husbands that received the praise. With these words, we arrive at the heart of the storm, civil rights movement at its zenite. Coretta Scott King was tired of being called Mrs. Martin Luther King and complained to a friend this would make her sound like the attachments that come with my vacuum cleaner. After all, she was the more politically active and experienced of the two when they met. It was she who persuaded her long hesitant husband to finally take a stand against the Vietnam War in 1960. It was she who took the phone calls at home with the death threat and joked that the caller should please leave his name and telephone number so that Martin could call back later and take the threats personally. After King's assassination in 1968, his male comrades in arms tried to marginalize her. But Coretta Scott King had an agenda. She took on the responsibility of continuing his legacy. She became a symbol of resilience and grace, inspiring millions through her dedication to social justice and peace. She was committed to social and economic justice as well as the fight against apartheid and later stood up for LGBT rights in opposition to a conservative comrade in arms. Coretta's life and work were guided by the belief that the struggle for freedom is a continuous process, a sentiment she eloquently captured in her words, struggle is a never-ending process, freedom is never really won, you earn it and win it in every generation. Another fighter that didn't hold back her voice was the great Fannie Lou Hamer, who said nobody's free until everybody's free, meaning not only black people but also women. Fannie Lou Hamer began working on a cotton plantation at the age of six where she witnessed the lynching of a fellow cotton picker. That horror stayed with her throughout her life. Heeding her mother's advice to read and learn, she yearned for education, but had to leave school early to support her family. In a cruel violation of her rights, Hema, like many other African-American women of her time, was subjected to forced sterilization, a practice so common in the South, it was dubbed the Mississippi appendectomy. Enduring extortion, threats and violence, including from the police, Hema bravely fought for her right to vote. She once said, I guess if I'd had any sentence, I'd have been a little scared. But what was the point of being scared? The only thing they could do was kill me. And it kinda seemed like they'd been trying to do that a little bit at a time since I could remember. Despite all of these challenges, she never stopped her fight and became a powerful advocate for voting rights, helping and encouraging thousands of African Americans in Mississippi to register to vote. Nevertheless, Hema faced ridicule for her lack of formal education and her southern dialect, but she found support from figures like Malcolm X and aforementioned Ella Baker. You see, the ladies stick together. She's widely known for her quote, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that still resonates, at least with me. Apropos being sick and tired, our next Next heroine was completely exhausted from preparing the mass demonstration around the march in Washington and mobilizing as many people as possible, so her husband had suggested that they should stay in the south to recharge their batteries. So they were sitting in front of the television when Diane heard her name being said on stage. She was one of those women being honored by name at a tribute to Negro women, but no one had told her that she was to be honored. Diane Nash was a key figure in the civil rights movement. She demonstrated remarkable strategic acumen and commitment to non-violence 
violent resistance from an early age. At just 22, she became the leader of the Nashville sit-in, which was a series of non-violent protests against segregation. Her decision to remain in jail under the jail no bail strategy significantly heightened public awareness of the movement's cause. She even spent weeks in prison despite being pregnant. Nash's involvement didn't stop here. She played a crucial role in the freedom rights, challenging racial segregation and interstate travel. Her efforts were so influential that President John F. Kennedy appointed her to the committee responsible for drafting the Civil Rights Act of 1964. She also orchestrated the Alabama Project and the Selma Voting Rights Movement showcasing her exceptional ability to organize and mobilize for civil rights. Her approach to activism was characterized by a deep belief in the effectiveness of nonviolent methods. As a leader in both the Freedom Rights and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, Nash's focus was on intelligent planning and unwavering dedication to the cause of justice. Her leadership was not one of loud proclamation, but of necessary actions. These silent warriors get often overlooked in history. So it was just last year she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from Joe Biden. Another one of those hit figures is Prithia Hall. Prithia Hall was a preacher and activist with exceptional oratory skills and played a significant yet often unrecognized role in the civil rights movement. Her profound impact is notably marked by inspiring King's famous speech. During a service in 1962, attended by Martin Luther King Jr., Hall delivered a prayer in which she repeated the phrase, I have a dream. This phrase, echoing her vision for equality and justice, resonated with King and later became central to his iconic I have a dream speech. Hall and King actually had a lot in common. She's recognized as one of the greatest preachers and she also believed in the transformative power of words using her speeches not just to communicate but to inspire and mobilize. One that was less about prayers but more about actions and activism is our next heroine, Gloria's Gloria. You probably know this photo here. It shows Gloria Richardson who pushes away a National Guardsman's bayonet during a protest. Pretty badass. Gloria was leading the Cambridge movement in Maryland with this fearless and assertive stand, advocating for economic justice and equal rights. Richardson's activism was marked by her use of direct action protest methods, including peaceful protests, protests, sit-ins and demonstrations against racial segregation and inequality in education, housing and employment. She stood out for her stance and the right to bear arms and self-defense, especially in response to violent attacks by segregationists and the police, reflecting a practical approach to the realities of the struggle. Richard significant contributions to the movement were particularly notable as she demonstrated strong leadership in a field predominantly led by men. Her activism not only paved the way for more assertive forms of protest but also highlighted the critical intersection of race and gender issues in the fight for civil rights. So we have the inspiration, we have the spark, we have the organization and the fight. This is the resistance. This is the civil rights movement. As the 1960s progressed, the civil rights movement began to evolve, giving rise to a more radical form of activism. This period, marked by the Black Power movement and a shift towards more assertive forms of protest, saw the emergence of awesome women who were unafraid to challenge the status quo. This is a time of Angela Davis, the voice of resilience and radical wisdom. Angela Davis stands out as a formidable figure in the struggle for civil rights, prison reform and racial justice. She's widely recognized for her iconic Afro and determined spirit, according to the motto, Black is Beautiful. Davis' life is a testament to the power of intellect and activism combined. As a highly gifted student exposed to communism early on, Davis pursued academia, studying philosophy in France and Germany, and holding several professorships. Her activism and the Black Power movement and scholarship became intertwined. She was accused of buying weapons for a shooting and therefore listed on the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives in the 1970s by J. Edgar Hoover. Leading figures like John Lenn and Yoko Ono advocated for her release. Still today, Davis continues to be active, focusing her research on the cruelties of US prison system and supporting campaigns such as the BDS movement against Israel. She's a living legend, even celebrated in songs by the Rolling Stones. Mick Jagger sang of a sweet black angel not a gun-toting teacher, not a red love and school mom, whatever that even means. The following line of Davis herself is better. I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change, I am changing the things I cannot accept. That's wow. No time to let that think in. We come to Kathleen Cleaver, who was the voice of the famous Black Panther Party. Her contributions, though, went beyond advocacy for the Black Panthers. She was instrumental in organizing community programs that provided food, medical care and assistance to families visiting loved ones in prison. Later, her journey with the Black Panthers took her from domestic activism to international exile in Algeria and North Korea. Following her active years with the Panthers, Cleaver's path led her to the legal profession, continuing her commitment to justice and 
advocacy. Her intelligence and eloquence as a spokesperson brought the struggles and aspirations of Black America to the forefront, marking her as a key figure in shaping the direction and impact of the Black Panther Party's movement. As a lawyer, she campaigned for freedom of the death row inmate Mumia Abu Jamal, and these days she's lecturing law at the university. Like the civil rights movement, women were a big part of the Black Panther Party too, where women actually constituted over two-thirds of the membership, yet few were in prominent positions. These women were aware that they are in this fight together. This is the ethos of our next heroine, Jalane Hunter-Gold, who lives by the motto, no matter what accomplishments you make, somebody helped you. Jalane Hunter-Gold is renowned for her contributions to both civil rights and journalism. She made significant strides in breaking down racial barriers. As one of the first two African-American students to enroll at the University of Georgia, she faced, as you can imagine, immense hostility and resistance. Hunter-Gold's journey is remarkable. She achieved notable success in journalism, earning multiple awards for her work. Her personal life also reflected her commitment to challenging societal norms. Her marriage to a white man during a time of intense racial prejudice in Georgia sparked widespread controversy and led to persecution, with the governor condemning their union as a shame and a disgrace. You can see, many of these firsts faced challenges, as did our next heroine, who probably has the most first in this list. Shirley Kajal was the first African-American woman elected to the United States House of Representatives. In 1972, she even courageously ran for the presidency under the banner Unboot and Unboost, becoming the first woman to seek the Democratic nomination and the first African American to vie for this top national office. She was very much aware that she'll face many obstacles and much hostility. When she was later asked about her courage and for advice, she said, If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Which reminds me of Queen Nzinga, who also wasn't offered a chair by the Portuguese, so she improvised. Kajum's statement became a rallying cry for her unyielding commitment to create space for underrepresented voices. Coming to our last heroine of today, starting with a question, is something right just because it is legal? Of course not. So where to go in order to align law and morality? Exactly, to the court. And that's what she did. Constance Baker Motley. As the first African-American woman to argue a case before the US Supreme Court, Constance Baker Motley set a precedent for future legal battles against racial discrimination. Her most notable victory was securing James Meredith's admission as the first black student at the University of Mississippi in 1962. Impressively, Motley won 9 out of 10 cases she argued before the Supreme Court, with the 10th eventually overturned in her favor too. Motley's journey to becoming the first African-American woman to serve as a federal judge was marked by her tireless work with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Her legal expertise played a crucial role in the desegregation of schools and the broader expansion of civil rights. Her rulings and legal strategies significantly contributed to dismantling the legal underpinnings of segregation. Her belief, something which we think is impossible now is not impossible in another decade, reflects her enduring optimism and dedication to the cause of equality. Motley did in the courtrooms what a hundred politicians couldn't achieve, shaping a more just and equitable society. What Constance Baker Motley and the other justice warriors of this list have in common is that they didn't fought their fight for prestige or money, they did it because it had to be done. According to the motto, fuck it, I'll do it. They did all of these things for the oppressed and for the whole society to become more human, more livable for everyone. And of course, there are much more of them. There's Ida B. Wells, Naomi King, Jean Young, Christine Kick Ferris, Dorothy Cotton, Juanita Abernathy, Mae Mallory, Merle Evers, Prince Lee, Betty Chabas, Audrey Lord, and many, many more. They were there at the beginning and they'll stay till the end. The struggle goes on. Now it's women like Tarana Burke, Letitia James, Fanny Willis, Ketanji Brown Jackson, who are continuing this fight. And those are just a few names. I'm personally deeply impressed by the courage of these women and I found myself some new heroes. Maybe you too. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe, comment, or leave a like.